So welcome everybody to today's ERA Journal Club. My name is Kate Stevens. I'm a nephrologist from the United Kingdom. And along with my colleague, Jennifer Lees, also from the United Kingdom, um, we are going to moderate today's session. So we are also joined today um, with a special guest, so uh, Professor Denny Fook from Lyon in France. Um, so most of you will know that Prof Fook is the editor of NDT. Um, he is due to finish his term uh, later this year. And so this may be his final appearance at the Journal Club. So we're delighted to have Prof Fook moderating with us today. A couple of housekeeping points before we get started. If you would like to ask any questions, please post them in the Q&A section and we will pose them to our panelists and speaker. And at the end, there will be a survey that pops up. It just takes a few seconds to fill in, but it's very helpful if you would take the time to do this for us. Thank you. So we're delighted today to be joined by Dr. Greg Hundemir, who is the Lorna Jocelyn Wood Chair for Kidney Research and an Assistant Professor of Nephrology from Ottawa in Canada. So Dr. Hundemir is going to present his study published in NDT last year. Um, so entitled Social Determinants of Health and the Transition from Advanced CKD to Kidney Failure. So joining Dr. Hundemir on the panel, we have Dr. Sophia Ahmed, also from Canada. So Dr. Ahmed is a professor of nephrology at the University of Calgary, and she's also vice chair for the Department of Medicine's research section. And her research focuses on sex and gender differences in kidney and cardiovascular outcomes. And Professor uh, Fergus Caskey, Professor of Nephrology from Bristol in the United Kingdom. So um, Dr. Caskey was the first medical director of the UK Renal Registry, finishing his term in 2019. And one aspect of his research focuses on identifying and reducing kidney health inequality. So we have an eminent speaker and panelists and are very much looking forward to today's session. So without further ado, over to you, Dr. Handemir. Um, uh, so first off, I'd like to thank the ERA for the invitation to speak with all of you today uh, and to share and discuss the results on behalf of our research team um, regarding the, our recent study on social determinants of health and kidney disease. Um, so to start off with, I have um, no disclosures to report. So the paper I will be presenting today is titled Social Determinants of Health and the Transition from Advanced uh, Chronic Kidney Disease to Kidney Failure. So I'll start off with some background on this topic about what exactly do I mean when I say social determinants of health. Um, well, social determinants of health refer to non-medical factors um, that can exert a major influence on health outcomes. So when I think of this, essentially these are conditions in which people are born into, that they grow up in and live with, and that they live in, which shape the conditions of their day-to-day -day life. So I took this image from the CDC website where they break social determinants of health into five primary categories, as you can see here. Um, so these include education, access, and quality, um, healthcare and quality, neighborhood and built environment, um, social and community context, and economic stability, which individuals are exposed to. So these social determinants can have a major impact on an individual's health based on a number of factors, such as things like whether they have health insurance, um, if they have access to appropriate healthcare providers, whether they can obtain medications, or even if they can access proper nutrition. Um, so as you can imagine, I mentioned a few things there, but that list could go on and on. So do these social factors contribute to kidney health? Well, there have been a number of prior studies showing the association between social determinants of health and kidney disease. Um, and there's too many to go over, but I've tried to synthesize uh, some of these primary findings for you here. So some social determinants that have been studied before, such as low income, lack of insurance, um, unemployment, and lower education, have been shown to strongly associate with increased CKD incidence, um, an increased rate of CKD-related complications, such as uh, vascular events, um, increased rates of albuminuria, increased rates of progression to kidney failure, um, increased wait times for kidney transplant, and increased mortality. So with that, we've kind of set the stage for that social determinants of health have a significant association with CKD and CKD-related outcomes. Now, I want to switch gears a bit and discuss some background on the importance of the transition phase for patients progressing from advanced CKD to kidney failure. Um, and that's because this is a really critical time period for both patients and providers. And this is because it can have a major impact on both short and long-term outcomes for our patients. So suboptimal transitions, which includes things like crash or unplanned dialysis starts and not having pre-created um, dialysis access created, they're strongly linked to a number of adverse outcomes. And these include 
as listed here, increased morbidity, um, such as increased uh, access complications, increased infectious complications, increased vascular events, um, higher hospitalization rates, um, increased mortality, even both in the short term and the long term, um, uh, heavy financial burden in terms of healthcare costs, and reduced quality of life for patients. So how someone transitions from advanced CKD to kidney failure really does matter. Now, because we now recognize the importance of this transition phase from advanced CKD to kidney failure, a number of so-called transition clinics have been developed here in Canada and around the world. So these programs are designed to capture patients who are at high risk for progressing from kidney failure uh, based on a risk prediction score, such as as commonly used in Canada, at least as the kidney failure risk equation or KFRE, or even just based on a very low EGFR. So the way these clinics are typically multidisciplinary and provide patient education, patient monitoring, uh, assessment for candidacy for different uh, kidney replacement therapy options, dietary advice, and social work support. So essentially, these programs help guide patients through this difficult transition phase to help them make these important decisions, uh, potentially prep patients for preemptive transplantation if that's possible, and if dialysis uh, is needed, to hopefully allow this to occur in a smooth, planned fashion rather than a crash dart, um, and ideally with a pre-created dialysis access. Now, despite the development of these transition clinics, overall transitions from advanced CKD to kidney failure remain suboptimal. So most studies show that approximately 40 to 60% of patients initiate dialysis in the inpatient rather than the outpatient setting. Most start hemodialysis with a catheter rather than a fistula, and only a small minority undergo preemptive transplantation. So a better understanding of what factors impact this advanced CKD to kidney failure transition phase may help to identify patients that are at high risk for these suboptimal transitions, so hopefully we could intervene upon them. This knowledge could, for instance, help to prioritize healthcare resources such as education and out outreach toward these susceptible patient populations. So what do we know on this topic already? So prior studies have looked at risk factors associated with suboptimal transitions, but they've primarily focused on traditional medical risk factors, including things like age, um, cardiovascular disease history, obesity, and late referral to nephrology. They haven't Many have not specifically looked at non-medical risk factors such as social determinants of health, um, and that was really the goal of this uh, study that I'm going to be speaking with you about today. So just to further emphasize this point, I'll highlight this review article on social determinants of health and unmet needs in nephrology. So here the author states that despite spending $34 billion annually on the care of patients with end-stage renal disease, the American public and nephrology community remain remarkably complacent about addressing upstream factors that influence the prevention, progression, and treatment of CKD. Uh, the authors go on to write that addressing unmet social needs with the same intention as treating hypertension, proteinuria, or anemia presents an important step toward making optimal health a palpable reality for all people who are at risk for or affected by CKD. So that sets the stage for the current study we're gonna be discussing titled uh, Social Determinants of Health and the Transition from Advanced CKD to Kidney Failure. Um, I would like to take a second to here to highlight the co-authors that are listed here who contributed significantly to this paper. So in terms of study design, we conducted, this is a retrospective cohort study of all adult patients that were referred to the Ottawa Hospital Multi-Care Kidney Clinic in Ontario, Canada. Um, and we looked at patients who progressed to kidney failure, um, which we de defined as dialysis or kidney transplantation, transplantation between the years 2010 and 2021. So just to orient you, the, the Ottawa Hospital Multicare Kidney Clinic is one of those transition clinics I described earlier. So this clinic serves a pretty large catchment area of approximately 1.3 million people. And this is the sole such program within that catchment area. So, Referral to this clinic is at the discretion of the primary nephrologist, but it's recommended when the EGFR go, goes below 25 or when the two-year risk of kidney failure based on the four-variable KFRE is, goes greater than 20%. So here we provide comprehensive multidisciplinary care for these patients, including specialized nursing, dietitian, pharmacy, and social work support. We also provide education on kidney failure treatment options, including HD, PD, transplant, as well as conservative care. As part of the initial clinic visit, once a patient is referred, our social worker meets face-to-face -face with each patient and collects some of this social determinant information. This is really how we captured this information for the study. And this includes education level, employment status, and marital status. 
Now, as we are studying transitions between advanced CKD and kidney failure, we only included patients who developed kidney failure within this time frame. Um, and again, that was dialysis or kidney transplantation. We excluded patients who had incomplete baseline social determinant information or incomplete baseline laboratory data. So in terms of exposure and outcomes, we looked at three specific social determinant factors as exposures. So these were the maximal achieved education level, which we categorized as college degree or higher, high school degree, or less than a high school degree. Um, we also looked at employment status, which we categorized as employed, unemployed, or retired. And finally, we looked at marital status, which we categorized simply as single or married. We also looked at three specific outcomes surrounding the transition from advanced CKD to kidney failure. So these included whether dialysis was initiated in the inpatient versus outpatient setting, whether preemptive access was created, which included AV fistula, AV graft, or buried PD catheter insertion. Um, and just to just to, to make you aware, at our center, it's standard uh, practice for patients who choose PD to place a buried PD catheter uh, once the patient's EGFR is in the 10 to 15 range. Um, and the final transition outcome we looked at was preemptive kidney transplantation. So in our statistical analysis, we conducted logistic regression analyses, adjusting for a number of covariates collected at the time of the initial clinic visit. And as you can see them here, they include age, sex, um, self-reported race, EGFR, urine ACR, um, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease history, and other social determinants of health. And so by the latter, I mean, uh, is that if we were looking at the exposure of education level, we adjusted for both employment status and marital status um, in the analysis and, and so on. Um, so this shows the baseline characteristics of our study cohort, which included um, a total of 1,070 patients. The mean age was 63 years and 63% of, uh, of our patients were male. The population was 73% white, uh, the mean EGFR was 18, and the median urine ACR was 204 milligrams per millimole. In terms of the social determinant information, uh, in regard to education level, 53% of the cohort had achieved a college degree or higher, 36% a high school degree, but not beyond that, and 11% achieved less than a high school degree. Um, in terms of employment status, 24% were employed, 24% uh, were also unemployed, and 51% were retired. 63% um, of patients were married, while 37% uh, were single. So let's jump right into the results. So um, in part A, you see uh, three outcomes here in terms of inpatient dialysis starts on the left, um, preemptive access creation in the middle, and preemptive uh, kidney transplantation on the right. You also see patients uh, broken down by education level, um, with the white bars representing less than a high school degree, the shaded bars representing a high school degree but not beyond, and the black bar representing a college degree or higher. Um, what you see is that a progressively higher education level was associated with a lower proportion of inpatient dialysis starts, a higher proportion of preemptive access creation, and a higher proportion of uh, preemptive kidney transplantation, all of which were st statistically significant. Moving on to part B on the bottom here, you see the crude and adjusted odds ratios for the association between education level and suboptimal transitions. You see that not having a high school degree was associated with 71% higher odds for an inpatient dialysis start and 37% lower odds for preemptive access uh, creation compared with having a college degree or beyond. There was no statistically significant difference in regard to preemptive kidney transplantation. Moving on to employment status and suboptimal transitions. In part A, you see that patients who were actively employed as represented by the white bars had a lower proportion of inpatient dialysis starts, a higher proportion of preemptive access creation, and a higher proportion of preemptive kidney transplantation, all of which were statistically significant um, compared with patients who were either unemployed as represented by the shaded bars or retired as, rep uh, as represented by the black bars. In part B, you see the crude and, and adjusted odds ratios for the association between employment status and suboptimal transitions. And I will focus primarily on the employed versus unemployed comparisons. So compared to patients who were actively employed, patients who were unemployed had 85% higher odds for an inpatient dialysis start, 47% uh, uh, lower odds for preemptive access creation, and 52% lower odds for preemptive kidney transplantation. And finally, moving on to marital status and suboptimal transitions. 
Here you see in part A, you see that patients who were married, um, as represented by the white bars, had a lower proportion of inpatient dialysis starts, a higher proportion of preemptive access creation, uh, but no difference in preemptive kidney transplantation compared with patients who were single, um, as represented by the black bars. In the multivariable uh, regression analysis shown in part B, we found that being single was associated with 44% higher odds for an inpatient dialysis start and 33% lower odds for preemptive access creation compared with being married. Uh, there was no statistically significant uh, difference seen with preemptive kidney transplantation. So I would also like to highlight several caveats, which I think should be factored in when interpreting these results. Um, first, this was a single center study, which may limit the generalizability of our findings. Um, and this is particularly relevant for several specific features of our center. Um, we have designed our clinic such that social determinant information is routinely collected among all our advanced CKD patients, which is not commonly done in many other centers. Um, many centers actually don't even collect this information until once a patient has started dialysis. Also, our study took place in Canada, uh, where universal health coverage is available, which is obviously not the case for many other regions of the world. Therefore, these findings may not totally generalize, in particular to low-income countries where the barriers to accessing care may be much greater. Um, second, we focused only on social determinant information that was routinely collected in our clinic. Other social determinant of health, of health information, such as income, literacy, um, housing status, neighborhood, so on, um, would definitely be interesting to study. However, we just did not have kind of granular data on these factors. Um, also, our population was predominantly white, um, and so we were underpowered to really look really in depth at race as a predictor of suboptimal transitions. Finally, the number of patients who received a preemptive uh, kidney transplant was relatively low, which limited our st statistical power to detect differences um, with this outcome. So finally, I'll wrap up here with um, our graphical abstract, which summarizes our results. So we show that in our study cohort, we found that lower education levels, unemployment, and being single as opposed to being married were associated with suboptimal transitions uh, from advanced CKD to kidney failure. And this included higher odds for inpatient dialysis starts and lower odds for preemptive access creation and preemptive kidney transplantation. So I will stop there, but I would be happy to uh, take any questions and I look forward to further discussion on this topic. Thank you. Great, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hundemer, for a really interesting paper um, that we can discuss today and also a beautifully clear presentation uh, summarizing this topic. And I know the, uh, the panelists are really keen to get their teeth into asking you some questions. So I'm just going to get straight to it. So first off, I'll hand, uh, hand over to uh, Professor Ahmed. Um, Professor Ahmed, I was hoping you could maybe give just a brief summary of where you think the strengths in this paper were and then maybe introduce a, a topic of discussion. Absolutely. So I, first, thank you very much to the ERA and, and the moderators for the invitation to be here today. I'm truly honoured and delighted. And uh, congratulations to Dr. Hundemer and the team for an excellent study. Um, and just to highlight one of the real strengths, I think, of this study is that is the setting. It was done in a universal healthcare setting, which has been a limitation of other studies that have looked at, tried to look at social, or, excuse me, have looked at social determinants of health and their impact on kidney outcomes, but have been limited by differential access to kidney care. Um, so I really wanted, and I really thought that this study highlighted that much of uh, the effect of these factors or social determinants of health happen outside um, the traditional healthcare setting. Um, and so really before people even get to us as kidney care providers. Uh, so one of the questions that I had, um, and as uh, Dr. Lees and Dr. Stevens highlighted, one of my areas of interest is sex and gender. Um, and many of these factors, actually all of them that you mentioned, are very gendered factors. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about that, but I wondered if you'd had a chance to look at stratifying the data by sex and gender. So for example, um, when you talk about marital status, um, does single also mean being widowed? Um, and we know that around the world, women are, they live longer with more comorbidity than do men, and so are more likely to live alone um, and uh, in an older age. 
from an educational perspective, certainly post-secondary education today um, of undergraduates, there are more women, and I'm using a binary here because that's the literature, but there are more women enrolled in post-secondary and who graduate with degrees compared to men in Canada. Uh, but given the age of this cohort, um, which was in the 60s, that probably is not true, and men tend to be more educated. And then lastly, the employment status. Um, again, it, particularly given the age cohort, men are more likely to be the primary earner and actually the, the one who has paid work versus, uh, again, assuming a heterosexual couple, the woman would be more likely to have unpaid work at home. So uh, for all of those factors, and I've certainly done a lot of talking right now, I, I wondered if there's any discussion or thoughts um, from your part about that. Well, thank you. I think those are really excellent points. And and just just to kind of be clear, so when we capture the data, we have we've captured sex. We have not traditionally captured gender, though. That's we've actually changed that over recent years. So we're trying to implement that on how we collect data, because I think that's going to be a really important factor looking forward. Um, we so in terms of kind of some of these specific looking at kind of sex to kind of look at the how the association between these exposures and, and outcomes. Um, we are starting to kind of dive into that more because um, we are able to kind of go back through the records and kind of look at, say, things like marital status. We're able to, when we, we kind of made it very simple and dichotomous of single versus married, like you mentioned, but we do have the ability. It's not, we have to do well to do some like chart review to figure it out, but there we, we can look more at kind of like widow and widower and kind of what the differences and outcomes and um, are between those um, when we break it down even further. And even looking at employment status and even education, we're really interested in looking at sex and gender in the future, hopefully, as we collect more and more information about how that kind of interacts and modifies these associations. Because I, like I said, I, like you said, I think there's, I think it probably, there's a very good likelihood that has a major impact because we even see it in like, it's very well known in the kidney transplantation and who are donors where women are more likely to donate, but less likely to be a recipient. Um, I think it's very possible that we'll see that in some of these associations, associations as well. And so that's definitely something we're interested at in looking uh, as we go forward. Great, any follow-up Professor Amidor? I, I might uh, harass Mr., uh, Professor Kasky for a next question. Uh, no, you can certainly pass it on, but yes, thank you for bringing up the preemptive transplant because that was something else I, uh, and not just women and men in terms of donors, but wives are more likely to donate to husbands than husbands to wives uh, for a variety of, of biological and, and gender related reasons. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Great, thanks. So Professor Kasky, I know you've got a couple of interesting questions up your sleeve as well. Yeah, no, th thanks, Jen. Um, thanks, Greg. Really nice talk uh, and great to hear you to go through it there. I Just take a step back, first of all, and explain to me, someone who's not familiar with the sort of Ottawa system, your tertiary um, multidisciplinary care clinic, is, is that accessible to you, the whole, everybody in the catchment area, or is there a selection that goes on? Are there other clinics that are peripheral run by other teams that can refer into that? Or are you looking at a selected group of people already? And this is a this is a, a sort of socioeconomic determinant of health in an already selected group? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And so we we do have a large catchment area, and but in geographically it extends quite far too. So we have some of our patients that come from several hours away to actually come to see us because we're the only um, kind of transition clinic in the area. Now the way we've designed it is your you refer you have to be referred from a nephrologist. Now whether that be within our system or outside, that's kind of the the entry point. Um, and certainly. Though we, it's not designed because of, for this, but it's definitely easier, I think, for patients to access the system if they're in Ottawa and have a nephrologist here. Certainly, they can be referred from outside, but it's not as easy to, one, see a nephrologist or commute all the way two or three hours to Ottawa. Um, and it's something that, is, in some ways, during the pandemic where everything was virtual, it sometimes made it easier for those patients. And as we transition out of the pandemic, it's harder for them to actually see us. So it, it, very, it was interesting how it kind of modified our ability to see these patients. Um, but one thing that we've been interested in looking at going forward is kind of looking at how rural versus not rural, because once you get outside of Ottawa, you get to fairly rural areas. Um, and these patients may not have, even though there's universal health care here, they may not be as readily able to see family physicians or get referred to a nephrologist. Um, so I certainly think there may be some I don't know, bias in terms of who actually enters our clinic versus not, even though the system ideally would not function that way. I think it 
in some ways it may be a bit unavoidable that those sort of things do happen and that patients who are in rural or in more urban settings may be more likely to actually reach our clinic. Yeah, no, I guess that was the, that was the the thing that was going through my mind. Are we looking at a, a group of people who've managed to access the service? So actually, there's a sort of an access issue even further uh, downstream. Just maybe while while I've got the mic, I had another sort of related question to that because you're looking at individual patient level socioeconomic determinants of health, uh, and and. Yes, that's that's great. In some ways, that's ideal. The other way of looking at it is the sort of area level uh, measures of uh, socioeconomic status, as we've used more in the UK. They tell you different things. So, so the area level tells you a bit about the health geography. So, I don't know the primary care system, the secondary care system, the the, the uh, I don't know the roads, the houses, etc. To some of your individual level social determinants of health could be still working through the area that they lived in have you been you know could you look at the area level uh, and and see whether some of the individual level stuff is actually explained by the area and some of the uh infrastructure perhaps if you can measure that at an area level yeah and it's it's a and that's an area we're actually have been talking about looking at as well. And so the one of the benefits of kind of doing research in Canada is we do have these access to kind of provincial databases. And so um, so we've been interested in looking at that in Ontario to because that opens up to the whole province and you may be able to kind of there may be things you could look at better than we looked at here because you could look at a bigger population and you may be able to break it down more geographically and kind of neighborhood income based on postal codes and things like that. I think the strength of a strength of our study is that we it was a single center and we controlled how we captured the data. So it was very more granular, I think, than you'd find with some like provincial database or something like that. But it it's not as it kind of does limit the generalizability and the going looking provincially or even countrywide or even beyond gives you kind of a broader scope of some of those um, factors that look at our health system as a whole, which may that it can be, but they can kind of factor in geography, access to care based on where you live, um, kind of what the healthcare setting is like in that area that um, we couldn't fully capture here. Like you may be able to tease it out a little bit in the local geography in Ottawa, but um, I think looking forward, that's I'm looking, I am interested in looking at these things on a bigger scale because I think it may address a lot of the points that you're raising there. I just, I guess, because you can't change, uh, well, you can't change marital status, but it's quite tough. <laughs> you probably can't. Uh, and, and education and and so on, whereas some of the sort of the area level geography access to healthcare might be changed modifiable. So I guess I was just thinking about it from that perspective. I'm I'm going to let Jennifer decide who who gets the next chance to ask. Actually, a question. I'm I'm going to jump in, uh, Fergus. Sorry. Um, so Denny you had your hand up. I, I think I think you wanted to ask something, and then I'd like to go to the audience because we have a couple of questions yes, from the audience. Yes, Thank you very much, uh, Gregory. It was a fascinating presentation. Uh, it came to my mind two observations. Uh, first, in some countries, you got a, a completely separated care between pre-dialysis and dialysis stage because doctors are not allowed to take care of both patients, particularly in the US, for example. So uh, in France, we, we are the same doctors and we, we have the motto, same doctors for the same patients. And I think it's it's important to know in Canada how, how it works in, in Ottawa, if uh, this may be one of the reasons to, to have a different uh, approach of the start of dialysis. And my second point is that uh, obviously nutrition is an important field. You, you already mentioned that. and. Uh, uh, those uh, individuals who don't have support will start dialysis sooner. So, for example, singles, uh, they may have junk food or they may just don't eat correctly when you are single. It's difficult to, to have a, a better nutritional approach. So I, I would urge you to look at that in the future studies uh, because it might be one of the reasons of... Uh, of uh, early start. Yeah, excellent. So to to kind of to just talk on your first qu uh, question there about how we practice on that transition from advanced CKD to uh, dialysis in Ottawa. Um, so it's our transition clinic is actually a group practice where there's 
Um, there's six of our, so our group of nephrologists in Ottawa is about 20, 25 or so, um, but about six of us do this pre-dialysis clinic. Um, once somebody transitions to dialysis, we actually all, essentially all of the local dialysis clinics around us, we our group runs, but it kind of, it's a, it's generally a different mix of nephrologists that you see it. So it's somebody in my group, but it's generally not me specifically. So it kind of opens it up to all our groups. So you, at least we're kind of familiar with each other, but it's not necessarily like if I see somebody pre-dialysis, I'm seeing them when they're on dialysis. It's very likely that it's going to be, they would see me pre-dialysis, but they would see one of my colleagues um, once they're actually on dialysis. So it's not, I think may not be as perfect for the patient to have the same provider following them all the way through, but it's at least in our same group and we can uh, connect with each other and, um, and it does help the transition to some degree, though it's not completely optimal. Um, and I fully, fully agree with you on your point about nutrition, because I think that's things like that are, are a huge factor. And these are, again, I think this, this paper really highlights that a lot of this is upstream factors. Like these are things that before somebody even reaches the healthcare system that are influencing these long-term outcomes. And I think that's really a point to hit home is that these are things that may mean it's almost some of the ways, like how do you tackle these? It may be more um, kind of attack, like how, um, how healthcare is provided, like access to education in a country, um, having kind of more, um, equality in terms of job access and opportunities for people as they as they pass through your um, pass through the system. So I think it's just act, being able to um, it's kind of like a system wide thing that you have to how you have to attack these social determinants of health because the, a lot of these things are bigger topic issues that are even outside of the healthcare system in general in terms of how we think of it currently. Thanks, Greg. Um can, can I just just go to a question from from the audience? So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you, Greg, as well, but I'm gonna go to everybody else first to give you a little break for a second. Um, so essentially, it's from Austria, um, and the, the comment is that in Austria, patients are provided with information about the different types of kidney replacement therapy, but nobody asks them what they need to achieve their preferred modality. So I think that's probably true in the United Kingdom as well. We give them all the information about the different forms of dialysis and transplantation and I guess if they said to us specifically well I really want to do home hemodialysis but I'm struggling because of this we would try to address that but I think probably Jane would agree that in Glasgow certainly we don't go looking for things that we could help with so um, I'm going to come to you first of all Sophia what 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 happens in Canada and do you have any ideas how we might um, address that so how we might intervene that's a great question um and these are largely things that are outside of our purview or, or control is probably a better word um, as nephrologists. Um, and very important, I know that they, I, I've actually read an article recently in the US, can't speak for Canada, where hospitals are now going to be graded on their ability to address these upstream factors. I don't know how they will tackle it. Um, certainly in Calgary, we have a very similar system uh, that uh, Dr. Hundemer has described in terms of a multidisciplinary clinic and, and um, it's similar catchment area. Um, we are a little bit different uh, in terms of we follow the same, it's one nephrologist that follows the same patient all the way, unless they get a transplant, then they transfer to transplant. Um, so I, I, you know, there is increasing uh, recognition of these outside influences, and I, I think that we don't address them very well, certainly in the Canadian healthcare system. Um, and I think as people who, you know, do have a voice um, because of who we are as physicians, et cetera, it behooves us to really talk to our politicians. Um, about not taking money away from healthcare, certainly, but uh, increasing recognition. There's only so much that we can do within healthcare. Um, I really liked your question about whether uh, you know we give people the information. We don't ask what they need in terms of doing a home-based therapy. There's certainly a push in Alberta, which is the province that I am in, west of of where Dr. Hundemer is. Um, you know, home-based therapy. PD versus home hemo, but we don't ask, or sorry, we might ask, oh, you don't have a, a home that's available or suitable to do PD, for example. Having said that, we have implemented uh, nursing assistants who go in both morning and afternoon. So you still have to have the space that you can do, for example, PD, you can store your supplies. Um, 
but you might not be capable of doing it yourself. So we have someone who goes in and, and helps hook them up in the morning, or, excuse me, unhook in the morning and, and hook up in the evening. So there are some strategies in place we could certainly do better. So I, I could say more, but I'll stop there. So yeah, no, so I think I mean I think that that's um it, it's true. So, so definitely in Glasgow, I'm going to come to you in a second, Fergus, to ask if it's any different in, in down down south in, in Bristol. But I mean certainly in Glasgow, I think one of the big issues is just what you've highlighted in Calgary that there's a lot of disconnect, isn't there? So there are problems that unfortunately doctors and nurses in the hospital can't solve um because things are just so disjointed between social care and you know government and policy and, and finance etc um Fergus do, do you have anything to add to that I mean do you find the same thing so I, I, the one thing I would add is just that there are tools so the um Yoda um Yorkshire um dialysis decision aid tool does uh provide a structure to um, find out what is important to patients ahead of the providing of information, helping them to make decisions. So I think there are some tools out there that do try to do this. I, I th um, do I personally do it? Um, not very well. And, and I, don't, I probably do th the way people have described already. You, you, uh, we do follow our patients through. So I, I will get referred to somebody with CKD and follow them through to dialysis and transplant. They do stay with, uh, with me generally. Um, and I therefore feel I get to know them, but I, I'm not sure that I that, that I specifically uh, set out to understand what's important to them before I start providing them with information about the options. Yeah, and Denny in, in France, are you going to put us all to shame and tell us that it's all done brilliantly? Well, in in France, we we set up uh, three years ago uh, a, a sort of uh, a bundle, uh, which includes uh, stage four and five pre-dialysis and also uh, five dialysis. So that's why my, my first notice regarding the same doctors, because uh, as you know, like in your unit, we are eight doctors and uh, we share all experiences and uh, we discuss the case of patients. And uh, in, in fact, uh, I think it is important to to get this continuum. We, we had a publication two years ago in France regarding stage four and five uh, lab lab parameters, and believe me, stage five before dialysis was the worst possible, which means that when patients are stage three and four, they have an adequate care, but when they go through stage five, uh, they don't have enough care. And so it's end up by dialysis. But during this stage, uh, they don't have enough support, w whatever, what blood pressure, medications, nutrition, so social coverage. So this stage five before dialysis is the most important step to, to, to implement, in fact. OK. And um, Fergus, I think you, you had something you, you made to add. Yeah, so, so what's something else that struck me, uh, we do this in Prepare for Kidney Care, which is um, offering people randomization to dialysis or conservative care. But we realize the importance of home visits. Um, and so um, explaining the dialysis and conservative care options to people in their home, where they're relaxed and where you can get a feel for their environment and they can be really confident and the sort of balance of power is different so they are in a position of power they feel more empowered to say well actually I don't want to spend time in hospital they're not worried about insulting you because they, you, they don't like your dialysis unit so I think we have gone out of our way to try and uh, offer those home visits and, and assessments and I think it's also true in clinic you know so if we are uncertain about someone's um, choices, our education nurses will go and visit them at home and and uh, and do that uh, education in the patient's home. And I think that's a really good way to understand what's important to people and how the dialysis would fit in or no dialysis would fit in with their their priorities and and uh, things that are important to them. Um, and so, Greg, you might you might not have, but do you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said here. I mean, I, I would kind of echo those sentiments. And I think especially the home visits um, is something we've tried to implement here as well. Um, I guess it's 
we primarily use it for patients that choose conservative care, um, but we also try to do it more for home hemo and, and PD now um, to try to give one, it gives our nurses a sense because our at least in PD our, and uh, conservative care, our nurses are heavily involved with home visits, um, especially early on. Um, and so it gives them a sense of I think it gives the patient a better sense of what things might look like and if this their choice is feasible. Um, it, but also gives our nurses a, a, a chance to kind of see their home environment and see how things how this may proceed and if, if it would be successful and the best choice for the patient. Yeah, I also think it helps with health literacy a little bit if you go to somebody's home, because somehow I think it just it, it's easier for them exactly as you've identified, Fergus and, and Greg, to kind of ask questions and, you know, it's easier for them to, as you say, feel like very comfortable to explain that they don't understand something. And yeah, so I think I think home, home visits are probably um, probably key. And I, I guess that would be nice in Glasgow if we could do more of them. We've got a, a great team, but they just there's only a couple of them. And so it's difficult to to get around everybody. Um, and Sophia, so I have, a, I have a quick question. I'm going to cut you off, Kate, if that's OK. Right, yeah. So this, I imagine, will be a very straightforward question to answer. And then I, I know uh, Professor Ahmed has a, a question for you as well. So I was interested in the it, so I know that there were limited numbers of people who actually received preemptive transplants in this population. But I was interested to know whether sort of what proportion of them were living donors versus deceased donors and whether there was any association um, with the social determinants of health um, you know, for, for living donation versus deceased donation as well. Yeah, so it's a, a good question. So we prim most of them were living donation because um, most of the at least the way ours work, unless your blood type, you're the right blood type, you're unlikely to get a deceased donor before you start. So most of our patients, the vast majority were living donation. Um, again, you were right that our, our numbers were fairly limited um, in that, uh, so it's hard to delve too much into some of those kind of finer points about living versus deceased and kind of the different social determinants, but it was definitely probably vast, vast majority were, um, were living donation. Yeah. I guess as expected, great. Uh, Professor Ahmed, you have a question. Thank you. I actually have two questions just based on the uh, discussion that we've had today, which has been fantastic. Uh, so one, we know that people who do home-based therapies, uh, specifically PD, uh, but, you know, home hemo as well, are, I'll use the word different than people who tend to do in-center hemodialysis. So I wondered if there were any had you had a chance to stratify your data looking at those who had perhaps and uh, who had planned on doing a home-based therapy versus non-home-based um, because they might be more homogeneous those two separate samples versus combining them and then the second question which is somewhat related is uh, before or after March 2020 the onset of the pandemic you had mentioned about there were very well as everywhere we all did uh, virtual clinics um, which took away some of the barriers. Um, and I wondered, but also, as we all know, the pandemic exacerbated some inequities as well. So I wondered, I, I don't know if um, you know, doing more virtual visits, if that would have made things better or perhaps made things worse. So I'll, I'll stop there and wondered your thoughts. Sure, sure. So great questions. Um, so the first one in terms of, we have started to look at this data in terms of why patients select PD versus HD and kind of if social determinants play a role in that as well. And I will tell you that we certainly see very similar trends here where um, the people that are generally choosing PD over HD, and we do have a, in terms of our center in Canada, we do have a fairly large uptake of PD, um, the, but patients that were choosing PD were generally more educated, more likely to be employed, um, more likely to be married. Um, it was kind of a lot of the same factors you would see. And now you, that could be for a variety of reasons, like maybe their housing situation is different and um, and having support at home may be different. Um, but it also may be uh, some of the education that that patients receive leading leading into this transition phase, because I do worry that even in our center, sometimes I think we get guilty of this when we're teaching people and talking to people about this transition phase, we too often take like a one size fits all approach. And sometimes we stick everybody in these group settings to educate them and think everybody can absorb information the same. And I certainly don't think that's the case. And I think the more we can uh, personalize things and figure out some of these individual fa factors to educate people and give them the information that they need on it on an individual level, the better. Um, so, but in terms of HD versus PD, we certainly are, as with our initial glance at our data, we certainly see similar trends to what I showed you with uh, the transitions. Um, 
and in terms of the pre and post pandemic, I guess I would say, um, our care. So it was it's interesting in our transition clinic because I think for some patients it may have actually improved access to care, but in other cases it worsened. Um, so there the people that I, the group that I think benefited from more virtual care is because we didn't allow it before in our clinic. And so it was this, like I mentioned earlier, we have patients that live two or three hours away. And when you're, a lot of these patients are very elderly with a lot of comorbidities that it's not the, the easiest thing to spend a day coming all the way into Ottawa and going back. Um, and it actually improved access to care for them. So actually, we were actually I think they actually preferred it. And in some ways, I think it was better for them. Obviously, what you lose, though, with patients that are close by, and I guess you could translate that to almost all patients, is laying, laying eyes on a patient makes a big difference sometimes, actually measuring their blood pressure, seeing what they actually look like. Because a lot of that, what they look like face-to-face, -face, I think often weighs in our decision on how best to proceed for a patient, because there's only so much you can glean over a phone call or a video call that seeing them in person does make a big difference. So I think there were pros and cons, and at least the way we've transitioned here in Ottawa is we're trying to bring everybody back in person now. Um, and I would say a lot of our patients, at least the more rural ones, have not been all that receptive to it. Um, and so we're trying to strike that balance of what the best approach is. And 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 so I think it's still playing out of how, how this is going to work in the long run. Greg, maybe can I follow up on that? I, 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 I'm also interested in the the people that choose not to have dialysis, um, and I noticed that they weren't they weren't included in your uh, analysis, and uh, I wondered if you'd had a look at that, or if, the, if there was a particular reason I, that we didn't understand about the database or about the clinic that that you had excluded, or maybe people don't choose not to have dialysis in Ottawa. I don't know, but might there be a difference um, by social determinants of health in terms of uh, what they choose? It, it could affect you know. So if it, it could affect your results a little bit because if more educated or uh, married people are more likely to choose one thing, then they'll get into your data set, whereas if they choose the other and choose not to have dialysis, they wouldn't. But, so maybe that was a rather long question, but just maybe a, a little bit of your thoughts on the, the group that aren't included, the people that choose not to have dialysis. Yeah, good. So there, we certainly do have a population. So we have like, um, half day every other week we have dedicated to a conservative care clinic so and that's actually attended by a palliative care physician as well so we certainly do have a subpopulation um, that choose conservative care because the reason we excluded them from this study is we were looking at the transition from pre-dialysis to dialysis or kidney failure and so we didn't end up including them in this but it's something we are starting to look at and seeing like how these social determinants factor into how somebody decides whether or not to choose conservative care because my my guess is you're going to see some associations there as well, but we're it's a much smaller population, so we're not as well powered to look at it currently. But I think as 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 we go forward, we're look, and definitely interested in in looking at that as well. And one of the other kind of when we started, we because we've brainstormed that a bit about how best to approach that. The other issue is that some of our patients choose conservative care because, as you know, patients with advanced CKD they often have many other comorbidities, and they may be on conservative care not necessarily because kidney failure is going to be What's, because then they actually have a lot of other comorbidities, so whether it be cancer, or advanced heart disease, um, and factoring in why somebody is conservative care, it's a, it gets to be a more complex question than just they're going to die from their kidney failure. Uh, there may be other many other factors in, and how that how that affects these decisions is it gets can be fairly complicated, but something we're definitely hoping to uh, to delve more into as we go forward. I had a question just to follow up on what you were saying uh greg i wondered i know most of the the vast majority of the cohort had hypertension and a significant number proportion had diabetes was there a difference um between people and i would recognize in this cohort probably most people are diabetic kidney disease or hypertension associated kidney disease but I suspect some of them had GN um, and maybe some of them were undergoing active treatment and, you know, would have had a significantly different perhaps reason for admission to hospital. And I can appreciate why they might have initiated dialysis during hospitalization. Uh, do you have any sense from your uh, cohort or study if there was a different, if that skewed the results or? Um, yeah, we, I guess we haven't looked at that specifically, but I like, so our, 
our population is mostly made up of like rapid progressors. So the, I would say the most common is diabetic nephropathy. You certainly have some ischemic nephropathy, hypertensive uh, nephrosclerosis as well. But um, these are generally rapid progressors. But there's certainly there's GN, there's polycystic kidney disease, there's all sorts of um, all like any, everything you would typically see in other transition clinics. So, um, but we're typically getting fast progressors. Um, and but we haven't specifically looked at that. But I would be curious to know how these how these factors differ by those different etiologies of CKD. Um, so we haven't specifically looked at it, but I think it's a definitely an interesting point. Okay, so I think that um, we'll maybe just draw things to a close. Um, so just before we do that, um, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Kasky, um, anything you would like to add? Or do you, do you feel that you have exhausted uh, all your questions? Yes, perfect. I, well, that's the correct answer. <laughs> that's the correct answer. That's the answer you want. Yeah, no, we could, we could, oh. well, we have more. Well, I mean, it, I guess Greg's already kind of touched on this. It is the I mean, what do you do next? How, how do you use this in the clinic? And how, how do you, uh, what are you planning to do to improve access to uh, services and, or reduce inequalities in that? Maybe in in one minute, Greg. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a that's a really challenging question because. Um, like we've talked about, these are a lot of these are policy level issues. So these this belongs to like our government and our politicians of how we um, deal with a lot of these issues in terms of inequalities with education and income and nutrition and all these sort of things. So it certainly gets beyond what we can handle on a, a physician by physician level. Um, in terms of what we can control, things that we've thought of is um, I think it's a little bit unique to Ottawa that we actually capture the social determinant data in a kind of a standard fashion. And I feel like a lot of centers, it's not kept, you don't, they don't necessarily meet with a social worker and get some of this information until somebody's on dialysis. Um, and so I think bringing things like that earlier in and recognizing that you have a person who's high risk for maybe um, needing more information or more, you know, more personalized education to help make these decisions. Um, I think that, I think that is something we can actually, something we as providers can actually control um, and maybe improving the education for certain people or groups that are 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 highly likely to have suboptimal transitions. So if we can identify some of those risk factors, maybe those are things we can implement right away. But again, a lot of these are policy level issues that definitely need to be uh, addressed on a kind of a higher scale. Yeah, lobbying government. Um, okay, so Dr. Um, Hundemir, thank you very much. For, um, that was a fantastic presentation. And uh, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Kasky, brilliant uh, discussion. Thank you for being panelists. So I think, Denny, this is, this is I think, your last ERA Journal Club as the NPT editor. So I'm going to hand over to you for the final word on today's Journal Club. Thank you, Kate. Um, indeed, I will finish in June. And uh, I was very pleased to, to see this Journal Club uh, starting uh, some, some months ago. And I think now it has been uh, matured to uh, an excellent level. And we have a, a, a broad uh, people. I think it's important that you, we are not just focused on on a small Europe uh, point of view. Even in Scotland, it's not really uh, um, British. I see, but um, I think it's uh, it's very important because at the end we have all of the same problems, and uh, everything uh, that Greg mentioned, we we are finding this in France. I'm sure it's the same in Italy, in, in England, in Scotland, in, in the US, it's even worse because uh, from my experience, these problems were completely um, undercovered. So um, I think it's important to, to start this new field now, uh, beside research, beside uh, uh, biology research, uh, we have to, to ensure that patients could receive the the best care we can. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much, everybody.